I want to begin with uh, the question, how? How, how was it that a small group of ordinary men and women, just like us, were able to take the gospel message and saturate the world, their world, with the good news of the, of the risen Lord Jesus Christ? How were they able to do that? How were they able to do it? They started in Jerusalem, went through Judea, Samaria. They, they took the gospel to the very heart of the Roman Empire, to the city of Rome itself. 2,500 miles by land from Jerusalem to Rome. How were they able to do that? And then when you read through the book of Acts, when you read through that, you find that there are some very frightening, some momentum-stopping moments in there. There are moments of intense persecution, both the Jewish and Roman persecution. We're just into the, into the earliest chapter, chapter 3, and, and leaders are being arrested. And then soon we have some that are put to death. You have Stephen that is stoned to death. And then you have James who is, who is martyred by a sword. He was killed with sword. And, and yet, whatever it is that they face, they face it with fearless faith. And time and time again, Throughout, uh, throughout the, the book of Acts, we find that they, they come up against something and, and there, basically it would be a, a moment to just stop and give up. But they wait, they pray, and then they go out and they witness the gospel. And in 30 years of time, they have spread the gospel to their known world. In Acts chapter 2, and we'll be looking at that in just a moment, not only do we find a record of the birth of the Christian community, birth of the church, but we also find the power behind the church, the power of God. Now, just a, just a little background. Um, in chapter 1, we are told about this was written after Jesus' suffering. That there are people that, that, that are gathered together that had actually seen Jesus suffer. Die on the cross. They knew that he was buried, but he didn't stay dead. Amen? That, that he rose from the dead three days later and he presented himself to them. And over a 40-day period of time, he, he showed himself with convincing proof that he was very much alive. And over that 40-day period of time, he taught them about the kingdom of God. About the coming of the kingdom of God because of the risen Jesus. And... And that, um, and that God was going to restore His image in man. What was broken, He was going to be able to fix um, because of the risen Lord Jesus Christ. And then He gives them an instruction that has to be the most difficult instruction for any one of us. The hardest thing to do. He told them to wait. He said, wait here in Jerusalem. Wait. Wait here in Jerusalem uh, until the promise, the, the, the promise of the Father. And he says in verse 4 of chapter 1, as John baptized with water, immersed uh, with water, he says, you will be immersed, you will be baptized, immersed in the Holy Spirit. Wait. And then in verse 8, he explains why. Because of the sheer extent uh, of, the, uh, of the, the, the mission that will be given to them. 
He says, when the power of the Holy Spirit has come upon you, then you shall be my witnesses, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. Wow, right? Wait. He says, wait. None of us like to wait. You know, it, and one of the reasons is waiting just seems wrong. To be still just seems wrong, you know, to wait. He says to wait. And, uh, and, and you know, it's, it, there's this desire in us, you know. We, we, we say things like, hey, we've, we've, we've been trained. We're, we're, we're ready to go. Let's go. Let's get with it. You ever heard that before? Let's go. And that sort of demonstrates our, our self-reliance. And we can be self-reliant. So, sometimes it says, well, uh, you know, it says, everything is ready to go. Let's get busy. Let's just do something. And that can show our impatience and, and, uh, and you know, and our, uh, our self-confidence. Oh, wait. None of us like to wait. But we don't, we don't go on our time when we think we're ready. We go when God is ready. Right? And the truth is, we can do a lot of good things. We can do a lot of things in our own human ability. We, we can do a lot of good in our own human strength. We can even build a kingdom in our human strength. But we will never be able to accomplish what God intends without Him. Amen? We will never be able to accomplish what God intends without Him. When you read through the book of Acts, what we find is something that is done that is, that is humanly impossible. It is God at work in and through and around around them. Truth is, we can do a lot of good in our own human strength, but we will never accomplish what God intends without Him. That we, we need to first receive before we do, before we go. And we can never offer to others what we have not received our, ourselves. But you know, uh, the, the, the uh, there's a, a, a real challenge for us to, to wait, to wait for the Lord. Now, I, uh, you know, I moved to West Texas many years ago. I was uh, 18 years old, 19 years old. I, you know, the first thing I did, I got me a pick em up truck, you know. I bought me a, 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 my first pair of cowboy boots. I got me a brand new pair of Levi jeans. Woohoo! Uh, I got me a big belt buckle. I went uh, and I got me a, a, a cowboy hat that was just creased in all the right places. You know, it was the, the, the year that Urban Cowboy movie was out. And I, you know. And, uh, and so I, I, I invited a girl to go with me and we went to the West Texas Fair and Rodeo. I, I, I tried, to, I walked like a cowboy. You know, I didn't ride a horse, I never had, but I, I just felt like, you know, I just felt like it. And we were on the, on the fairgrounds, and we were walking along, and, and there, there was a guy standing by this table, and he was calling, calling these guys over, and he said, come on over here, you young men, he said, for five dollars, you can win your girl, this great big old teddy bear, for five dollars. Well, what it was, it was an arm wrestling table. And so you, you, you look over there, and he said, all you got to do is you got to beat our champion, and you can get your, gar your girl this big old teddy bear. And so I look up there at that arm, look over there at that arm wrestling table, and there's a guy standing over there, and I'm thinking, just maybe, just maybe, right? And there's a couple other guys, they're thinking the same thing. They paid their $5, we stood up there, and the guy that was standing by the table, he was a lure. He just acted like he was just, a, you know, standing by, you know, it's just a bystander to me. And, and then 
And then he said, oh, here's our champion coming now. And this guy was the size of Godzilla. He shook the ground when he walked up there. His arms were, his arms were bigger than my scrawny legs. The two guys that were ahead of me, they just said some cho choice words and they just walked off. Nah, you know, walked off. But my pride was on the line. And I committed my whole self, all 137 pounds of me. And I stood up there. I looked at Godzilla. And let me just say, it turned out exactly the way you thought it would. He about, he about tore my arm right off of my body. He had absolutely no compassion whatsoever. None. Now, we've, we've, all, we've all done it. We've all gotten ahead of ourselves. We've all gotten ahead of God. We found ourselves in situations where you go, what in the world am I doing? We all know what it's like to run out of gas. We all know what it's like to be spiritually frustrated and need the power of God. You know, let's think about... Think about that, that church in India that is facing certain persecution. But the desire of their heart is to be bold witnesses. You think of the, of the, the woman who wants to be a, a witness, a faithful witness to the new lady that just moved in, the neighbor that moved in across the street. And she's prayerful about that. Or the you think about the, the guy that works out at the oil rig. And, and it's his first job, and, and he's the only Christian that he knows of, and everyone there knows he's a Christian. And yet he's desiring to be a faithful witness. Or you think about the college student that's, that's already got an offer of a job in May when he graduates, but it's in a, it's in a metroplex area, met, metropolitan area, hundreds of miles away from home. He's going to take the job, but he's hoping to be a bold witness. And think about our church. Think about us. Think about the call of God upon this congregation to be, um, to be a, a leader in the gospel. To be a leader in, in creating partnerships with others in our South Texas community and to lead the way in reaching the South Texas community for the Lord Jesus Christ. What in the world are we going to do? How are we going to get this great task done? How will it be ensured that we will be strong, bold witnesses for the Lord? Well, look at the Scripture today. God's Word has a word for us in Acts chapter 2. I want to work my way through these 13 verses of Scripture. And we begin with verse 1. When the day of Pentecost came. Pentecost is a, is a word that actually means the 50th day. It is the 50th day after the Passover. And it initiates a festival, or a couple of them there. It was a festival of first fruits. So it was a, it was a day long festival of, uh, of the first fruits of the harvest. It was also a, a, the, the beginning of the, the, uh, the, the, week, the week of tabernacle and the, and the giving of God's law from Moses to the people. And so people. Jewish men and women from all around the Mediterranean world and other areas would have come to Jerusalem on that day, the day of Pentecost. And by the way, it is also the 50th day after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You think about God's timing. The day of Pentecost, the city of Jerusalem, and all these people from all around the world gathered there and then it says they, 
they were all together in one place. The they is the 120 that were gathering together. Now, they were waiting patiently, and, and they'd go about their lives during the day, but then they'd come together in the morning, and they'd come together in the evening, and they're waiting for the promise of the Father. They're waiting for the gift of the, of the Holy Spirit. They are waiting, and then it happens. Verse 2. Don't you love the word suddenly? Suddenly it happened. A sound like the blowing of a, a violent, a strong wind came from where? From heaven. Uh, uh, the, the word wind is often symbolic of the, of the Holy Spirit, the breath of life. And maybe we could see it that way, the breath of life came into the room and filled the room where they had gathered and where they were sitting. Verse 3, and they saw what seemed to be like tongues of fire. Now, don't think of tongues falling out of, you know, human tongues falling out. But you, you think of fire. You know, we use the, 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 the metaphor of fire like licking up. You know, the fire just sort of lick. And it seemed like fire, like tongues of fire, wisps of flames coming down and dividing up and falling on upon each and every one of them, all, verse 4, all of them, how many is all? All of them in the room were filled with the Holy Spirit. You know what that's like when you come to know the Lord Jesus. That's the Holy Spirit coming into your life. We are dead in our trespasses and sins. But when He comes in, He brings him into us the resurrected life. He breathes life into us. I don't know about you, but when I got saved, it was like getting plugged into the electricity. You ever been shocked by electricity? I took a butter knife once. I put it in a wall socket when I was four years old. I, I know what it's like. I never forgot it, and I never did it again. It may explain a lot about me. Right? <laughs> then it says, and they began to speak in languages. Glossalia, glossary in languages empowered by the Spirit that has come upon them. Verse 5. Now they were saying in Jerusalem, God fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. Boy, say it this way, ain't God good? He knows God's timing is perfect. Perfect. God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. And when they heard this sound, they, the sound of the people coming out, coming out from this room, and they're, and they're speaking, they're speaking in these languages. And it says, when they, when they heard this sound up, a crowd came together in bewilderment. They are in awe because each one heard them speaking in their own language. You know, most everybody would have spoken Koine Greek. It wasn't necessary for them to be heard in another language. They would have all had a common language. But it was that they, they're bewildered, they're in awe because they're hearing, they're hearing their own language. Each of them from all these different parts of the, of the world. And utterly amazed, they ask, not all these men who are speaking Galileans, then how is it that each of us hears them in his own native dialect. And then we have, the, we have the places that they, uh, where they came from. We have these people, were for, they were Parthians and Medes and El, uh, Elmanites and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia and Judea and Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia and Phrygia 
and Pamphylia and Egypt and parts of Libya near Serene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts from Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own language. And amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Now when I comb my way through this passage, now there would be a hundred things we could point out that would be important to all of us. But when I comb through this passage, there are certain things that, that I want to highlight about this. Bring up that next slide. I want you to see this. It's a miracle of Pentecost. And the one thing that comes out in this passage is that the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, the gift of the Holy Spirit, is for every believer. Not just like in the Old Testament where it was for, for kings, anointed kings, and, and priests, and prophets. But, but the Holy Spirit, the breath of life, is for the anointing is for every believer. They were all filled. How many is all? All. Oh. All of them that was in there. All of them, all believers. And then there's the miracle of hearing. Hearing. That God opens our ears to hear. And we, they said, we hear them declaring what? The wonders of God. It wasn't just that they were hearing a language, but it was what they were hearing in their own language. They were hearing the wonders of God. And you know it takes an act of God for someone to, for God to open up someone's ears to actually hear. And maybe for the first time, some of these are hearing the wonders of God they have not ever heard before. And then the miracle of opening hearts. Ears to hear, hearts to respond And it says they were amazed and perplexed and are asking the question, what does this mean? They're they're asking it to the the group of them that have assembled. What does this mean for for us from all over the the world? What does this mean for me? You know, what does it mean? And, And they're asking reflective kinds of questions. What we know is, what we know is, is that in just a few verses, there will be a message that will be presented by Peter in the power of the Holy Spirit. And because their ears are open to hear, and because their hearts are open to receive, some 3,000 people will repent. They will change their mind about Jesus. Many of them had stayed in the city after the crucifixion, and stayed for that festival, and they are changing their mind. They've changed their mind about Jesus, and 3,000 of them will believe that is a miracle of God. So this is the miracle we find in these verses and the empowerment that that is behind it. But what does that mean for you? What does that mean for you? What, 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 does, what does these verses, how, how do we apply these verses to ourselves? And you think about yourself as a disciple, as a Jesus follower, a person who is desirous to be found pleasing in the sight of God. Well, these are the things that I think apply because the Holy Spirit came and came into your life, you are not alone. (laughs) Amen? You're not alone. You have the presence of Jesus in you. No, the Holy Holy Spirit makes Jesus as real to us today as He was to those who walked with Him in the first century. Makes His resurrection from the dead as real to us and as assured in us as it was for those who walked with Him. After the resurrection. You're not alone. You have the, the, have the presence of the Lord. Who never leaves and nor forsakes you. Who is at work in you. And then you have a church family. With you. Isn't it good to be a part. Of the family of God. This is a family gathering. 
And then you're not powerless. Whatever it is that's come up against you, whatever you're facing, whatever it is waiting for you out there, whatever is waiting you on, from, on Monday morning, whatever it is that is there in front of you, you are able and enabled to face it with fearless faith. You don't have to be afraid. And you are an empowered witness. That's what it means. And just think about, just, just think about that, that church in India, let's say, that is sure to face persecution. But their desire is to be faithful witnesses. And so they gather and they wait and they pray for the power that God has promised. You think about the, the lady that, that is desirous to be a witness to the new neighbor, the woman that's moved in across the street. And rather than just going across and just blurting out, do you know my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? I'm not saying that that's never worked. Taking time to build relationship, to get into the context Prayerful to be a witness, a bold witness, but praying and waiting. And then the Holy Spirit saying, now's the time. Think of the guy that's working his first job out at the oil rig, and he may be the only Christian. And you can imagine some of you have lived, worked out in a place, in a field where you know what it was like to be a Christian out there. And once they find out you're a Christian, you know, I worked in construction, they find out, oh, you're going to be a preacher boy one day. Oh, my goodness. Uh, you know, you just hear it. And sometimes it is difficult, and there are some people that will just test you and you know many of you are right there you know what it's like but the desire of that person is to be faithful in his witness and so every day he prays and he waits for the Holy Spirit to move and you know what there will come a moment maybe not to the whole group maybe to the whole group but there will come a moment where God will give opportunity to testify of faith. Just waiting. Just waiting. You think, about, um, uh, you think about the college student. He's going to take that job in May after graduation. He's going to move hundreds of miles to the metropolitan area. We know what happens to college students so often. When they get off into the big city, they sort of just lose their way. But this person is praying. I want to be a witness, a bold witness when I get there. Waiting, praying, trusting. And what about us? God has given us a vision to be a leader in South Texas. Not because we're the biggest church, not because we're the wealthiest church, but because He has chosen us. And we say, God, what can we do he said, not much without me, but in me you can do all things because I give you the strength. That's true for individuals. That's true for the congregation. And we're looking, we're praying, we're waiting, we're looking for partnerships, and we're looking for possibilities for God to show us what only He can do. And then to be faithful when the time comes. Maybe today, this will be your day. You've, God's given you ears to hear and a heart to receive. Why not stand up for Jesus today and receive the new life that He has promised? Why not today, if you are a follower of Jesus, talk with Him about how you move forward and discover where He is at work and work in His strength. Maybe it takes some repenting. And maybe it takes some adjusting. But what about us as a fellowship? Will we do more than just say, Yeah, I'll pray about that, but don't pray. 
could we just challenge one another to wait and pray? You know, the missions committee is meeting today. They're sort of our ears and our eyes. I'm challenging them and challenging you to pray and ask God for holy boldness, for eyes to see vision clearly what God wants us to do. Not just do, but where God calls us. God's calling each of us when we go out of here into our mission field, but we don't go alone. We go with Him. Lead us, Lord, like a shepherd. Guide us along the way. In Jesus' name, amen.